Hello there and welcome to this video um, which is part three of my history of jazz and today I'm going to be talking about the de development of virtuosity in jazz. So if we go back to 1917 and we listen to that original Dixieland jazz band recording it's, it's like music from another planet. They're doing things that people have never heard in real strong groove. You know it sounds like anarchy, you know, at the time, this band was treated like the Sex Pistols. You know, they were ripping up the rules of music. And the reason was is because they were using sounds and noise and, and bringing that into the thing. But it, it, in, in terms of sophistication, this music isn't sophisticated in its statement, as is Lou Armstrong's statement with the Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, which spanned from about 1925 to 1929. So in those eight years, something's happened. The musicians are listening to and they're learning from each other. You know, the, the, uh, as I've said before, the commercial um, structures of the recording music industry has actually pinpointed a want for this type of stuff. People are listening to these playing and they're, they're being transported by the groove, which is really visceral. But on the top of that is really incredible instrumental playing. And this instrumental playing has its own voice. So suddenly you can become a fan of Sidney Bechet because you love his sound. You can become a fan of Lee Armstrong because you love his sound or the sound of his voice. Right, and musicians are listening to that and they're communicating that to each other and they're learning from it. You know, so very quickly we have this sort of cross-pollination where people start to do stuff which is amazing, which sells records and everybody wants to do that. What is that? Well, there's loads of things. And let's just pick on one. The development of the rhythm section. You know, jazz has got this groove to it. It's got this swing to it. That's coming from the rhythm section. You know, the, the recordings in the early days can't really record the drums. God knows what the drums are doing in live gigs. You know, they've got a bass drum, snare drum and all these, these contraptions, traps in front of them. But of course they couldn't record that, so that on, often on a record they have to, do, you know, make do with a wood block. You know, the hi hats are really important here. We discuss these hi hats people because they're a little bit quieter and there's less bass. They could be recorded well. So in jazz, you suddenly see the development of the rhythm section, and what happens is all the other um, folk forms in America, blues and country music, they go, wow, that's good. That's selling records, and so that rhythm section is plonk plonks into all these other. <laughs> Stars of music, um, you know. If you're list, if you think you play, you know, blues drums, or you think you play country drums, no, you don't. You play jazz drums. The only drummers around in the 1920s are jazz drummers, and that's pretty much the stays like that till the 1950s. If you're a drummer, you're a jazz drummer. There's no other type of drumming. There's only jazz drumming, right? The way the piano comps, that rhythm section gets transported into all the different styles of music. And so, you know, if you listen to blues, you've suddenly got, you know, people like Leroy Carr and Bessie Smith. You know, they're all, it's urban blues. Urban blues comes before all that, you know, sort of Delta Robert Johnson blues. That's a bit of a contrivance, I think. You know, that was, again, commercial music record labels, small labels looking around and going, this blues is really selling, this urban blues is really selling. What else is out there? And finding that there was suddenly this, you know, country blues out there and there's there's stories of um very sophisticated blues musicians like you know like uh, like big bill bruns he was it was an urban jazz musician he's working uh, urban blues musician working with jazz musicians working with the rhythm section hearing that the labels are recording sort of acoustic delta blues and running down and you know taking off his sharp suit and putting on some overalls you know and pretending to be what the what the record industry wanted you know this is so important to realize is that jazz we may see it as quite an esoteric form now, but it starts out as the greatest popular music form of the early 20th century. And people want that virtuosity. I think the modern era, the, you know, I've discussed this in the, the previous video, but the modern era is suddenly a new era where, where technology has changed absolutely everything. You know, people are driving around in fast cars, there's airplanes f flying around the sky, you know. Um, people have moved to... Um, cities and they're in an industrialized uh, setting they're working often in like sort of henry ford's factory if you can imagine that they're all sat there working they all they're all cog in the machine you know you ever see that charlie chaplin film you know modern times where he actually becomes a cog in the machine you know but they're all a cog in the machine 
And when they listen to jazz, they hear a machine which is really well oiled, where everyone's a cog, but they're able to express their individuality within that machine. It's the American dream, right? And so these voices become really, really important. And in a matter of 10 years, jazz musicians start to become extremely virtuoso, right? And I just want to talk about two musicians at this point, which are worth checking out, you know, is that the one is Big Spiderbeck. So um, Big Spiderbeck is a white middle class cornet player that heard Louis Armstrong, was so blown away by what he did, that he did what he did, and he added to it, all right? Because jazz enables you to do that. A white middle class uh, um, musician can listen to Louis Armstrong. There's nothing in the style that stops them from then taking that and advancing it, you know? And Louis jammed up with Bix. He, he loved Bix by the Bix playing. Uh, Bix by the Bix became a, a star, you know, he was poor, playing in Paul Whiteman's, you know, group, which was, you know, of course, at this time, no black musician was ever allowed to become the king of jazz, you know, uh, that went down to Paul Whiteman. Um, Paul Whiteman, I think, would have worked with black musicians if the prejudice hadn't been against that. So he needed to find musicians that were able to, you know, play like Louis Armstrong, but were white, you know. Um, and I think it's, it's a testament to jazz that the jazz doesn't turn around and go, well, we discount what Big Spider Big did. Because he was a virtuoso musician and he advanced the form, he, he becomes a superstar, absolutely virtuoso. Um, and the melodies that he played, you know, Hoagie Carmichael Michael wrote an incredible tune called Stardust, which has got an incredible melody. And that melody was taken directly from hearing a, a big Spider Beck solo. So this is how the virtuosity starts to emerge, it starts to move out. It's, it's out in popular groups um, like. Paul Whiteman's group, suddenly it's, you've got this well-oiled machine but where people can step forward and take solos and express themselves and anyone's allowed to express themselves within this form. Of course, that line of the Paul Whiteman group, you know, the Fletcher Henderson big band, that's eventually going to then be taken up by people like Duke Ellington and Count Basie. You know, they're going to create ways of organising the music even more. You know, Duke Ellington's the great genius of showing how you create like classical level composition, but with a with a you know a, a group of jazz musicians that, that have all got their own individual voice. What he did is that when you know when when Duke's writing a piece of music, if he's voicing a chord and that chord's got a first, a third, and a fifth, and he's voicing that. He's not just thinking of the chord like the classical musician. He's thinking that Johnny Hodges is going to be that third. You know, Paul Gonzalez is going to be that fifth, and he he is that chord with their voices, and he writes with that in mind. This is like nuclear physics in music. This is like letting a bomb off that's never going to go away. You know, it's, it's any musician that works down popular music does this without thinking. But these jazz musicians had to pioneer it. But also at the same time, you get musicians that are pushing the virtuoso level to extremes. Within a few years of jazz being recorded, you know, 10, 12 years emerges somebody like Art Tatum. Now, I think to this day, Art Tatum is still the greatest um, virtuoso musician that has ever existed in any style of music ever, right? Um, classical musicians heard what Art Tatum was doing and they thought, well, this must be two pianists playing. There's no human can play this, you know, <laughs> all at the same time. Art Tatum, I think, set a standard within jazz along with people like Coleman Hawkins, who was the first great saxophone player, and then later on Lester Young. There's a whole bunch of real virtuoso musicians that are going to set a standard, which can't be... And this, this need to explore that through the 1920s and the 1930s is really interesting. But at the same time, something else happens in the history of jazz, is these big bands, which are really an embodiment of the American dream, like I've said, really like these well-oiled machines with a leader but where people can step up and have a voice right um and with geniuses like ellington and count basie being able to organize that sound in new ways creates a new style of music which is swing now jazz has been successful but it was not going to be anywhere near as successful as swing so in the 1930s suddenly jazz hits its 
commercial peak. It's the biggest commercial form of music in the world at that time. You know, the, these people are stars. They're getting in Hollywood films. They're multimillionaires. We do see a division that is, ba is based upon the prejudices of American society, a division between the black bands and the white bands. So you do have underneath the pioneers, you have people like Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Fletcher Henderson, and then later on incredible bands like Chick Webb's band, you know, and, and sing is emerging out of that like uh, Billy Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald. And then on top of that, you have the superstars, which would be your Benny Goodmans and your Artie Shaws, you know, and the Dorsey brothers. And they're like film stars, you know, they're, they're like celebrities, you know. Um, it's really interesting that with Big Spider Beck, we see the first sort of fatal superstar in music, really. You know, there's been so many of them since, you know, from Robert Johnson to Jimi Hendrix, you know, these people who died young, uh, 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 you know, the James Deans and all that sort of thing that becomes part of the sort of legendary folklore of popular music. Well, Bix is the first, Art Tatum is the first jazz virtuoso. And, uh, and in Gene Krupa, the drummer with the uh, Benny Goodrum band, we get this sort of first heartthrob, the first film star, you know. I, I find Gene Krupa a really interesting musician because he, he's got film star good looks, he's got so much charisma, and he can really play, you know. And so he's become a superstar because people wanted to see his sort of virtuosity. Virtuosity was a commercial... Um, requirement in the 1930s amongst these groups really interesting thing that never gets mentioned you know um, as jazz progresses through the 30s those swing bands although really really commercial are also pioneering new things going on okay um, so for example in Benny Goodman's band he, he, um, he takes on a guitarist called Charlie Christian Charlie Christian dies in 1942, aged about 23, but in the few years he's working, he basically invents the language of electric guitar playing, which is going to have a huge, huge influence on rock and roll. There's an example of the stuff that's going on in the swing bands at that time. Um, Joe Jones, you know, uh, and the rhythm section of the Count Basie are really laying down the, the, the foundations of a new type of rhythm section, which is really based around drums and bass and piano and guitar. You know, which is going to be the foundations again of, of, of rock music and pop music. You know, all this stuff's happening in the swing bands. And these incredible virtuoso musicians, I think, they're heading for something, which is the Second World War. So as we go into the Second World War, the, if you imagine, you know, American troops going to war, you can hear the sound of the swing bands as they go. But the... <laughs> and... Something else I'd like to mention is in the 1920s with jazz, the um, recording industry had really created jazz. I've said this in other videos. But um, for various reasons, they recorded that it was just, I think it was a lack of vinyl that happened in the 1930s. The depression, people not being able to buy records. Is the, record, the recorded industry, the, like buying actual records, vinyl recording industry, it faded away. And that was replaced by radio. You know, if you could afford a radio, they'd suddenly have music in your house. And I think the radio really, um, the radio really revolutionised jazz at that time. You know, Duke Ellington really found fame. You know, he was working in the Cotton Club and he was performing. And I think every week at least, his, his record, he, he was broadcast live to the whole nation. In fact, this is what made the superstars. The technology is really important here. So as, as, as you go to war, we now have a, a form that is sold, you know, the recording industry, as the a, as a depression ends, suddenly they're buying records. People like Glenn Miller, the superstars, they're selling millions and millions of records. And those records are going to become the, uh, the sound of war, you know, the Second World War. It's going to become the sound of that, you know. But other musicians are pioneering other things at that time, right? And it's coming out of the big bands. And these musicians are jamming, they're jamming after hours in smaller groups. In the 1940s, there's going to be um, a collapse of the big bands. They're, they're so, a big band costs a lot of money to keep on the road. You, you have to 
um, have a lot of money to pay all the musicians to transport them to put them into hotels, right? Um, one of the things that the big uh, bands did is that they really, you know, created popular music. So, you know, Bing Crosby and Frank Starcher come out of the big bands. You know, Frank Starcher comes out of the Dorsey, Tommy Dorsey's band, I think. And and suddenly you've got these pop stars and they're in films, right? And pop music actually starts to take over. The recording starts to take over. And I think it really creates what we see as modern pop music, which suddenly now becomes less interested in virtuosity and a lot more interested in the sort of film star, pop star, Frank Sinatra, and what's going to become Elvis Presley. That becomes really prevalent at that time. And the bottom drops out, you know, the, the, um, the bands have to get smaller. And so in the 1940s, you see a couple of things happening. The sort of commercial rhythm and blues aspect of the big bands gets shrunk down into much smaller groups. And, and you sort of get these sort of rhythm and blues bands, people like, you know, Louis Jordan and, um, you know, Big Joe Turner and, you know, those, those types of bands emerge. If this, the form simplifies. There we have the roots of rock and roll emerging in the 1940s. Um, but at the same time, other musicians are trying to extend the form and they sort of accept that the form's going to be less commercial. They, they, it's as though certain musicians want to make the form an even more of an art form but there's also like this punk thing going on in the 1940s is that they want to create a, a style of music which is unplayable from the generation before this of course is bebop um, bebop becomes in the 1940s the next great you know music form in jazz it's divisive jazz at that this point splits two ways you've sort of got commercial jazz which is sort of the Louis Jordan, it's got vocals, you know, it's come from Cab Calloway and all those type of artists, you know. The form simplifies, it's much more about songs, it's selling lots of records stills, but the, still, but the, the, the groups have shrunk down, it's becoming, um, the blues is coming to it even more and it's, you get sort of these rhythm and blues artists coming through. And at the same time, we get this even more sophisticated music, which is almost going to sort of shut off the generation that went before. How do they do that? Well, one of the things they do is they take the mechanism of jazz, which is improvising within a popular music form over the chord forms. And, and, and these musicians start to extend the forms. Now, who's doing this? Well, there's two musicians we really need to talk about here. One would be Dizzy Gillespie and one would be Charlie Parker. Dizzy Gillespie is the great organiser. He's got his head on his shoulders. He's very solid, you know, virtuoso musician, can do all this stuff but he organises it and he creates a vehicle within it. You know, there's a whole bunch of musicians, you know, like I said, Charlie Christian, but there's people like Thelonious Month, Kenny Clark, all these musicians are experimenting with the form. What Charlie Parker famously does is um, he looks at these popular music forms, he looks at the chord progressions. And what jazz musicians do is they, they, they improvise through the chord tones of the chord progression. So if you've got a C, you would play C major, you would play either C, E, or G. They would be the um, the chord tones, and your improvisation is made out of winding through those chord tones. This is what Lee Armstrong does, as well as all the blues stuff and all the honking and, and other stuff we've talked about. But that's the basic way you improvise through a, um, a popular music form. What Charlie Parker does is he um, he looks at the extended notes. So with a C major chord, that would be D, the 9, it would be the F sharp, which would be the sharp 11, and it would be the A, the 13. He looks at those notes, and it gives him this much more colourful palette. And as he says, suddenly he could fly. He could just fly through the chord progressions, and it almost like transforms the popular song into something else. So um, bebop musicians would take a popular music form, extend the chords, and then great create much more complex melodies over those forms. But that's not everything that they did, you see. That's not everything. Um, I think Charlie Parker was from Kansas City. And in Kansas City, there was, um, within the big bands there, there was a style of music where you would play double time, you know, over the tune. So, you know, if the tune was like, you go, that's the normal time. And then you come in, and you came in with this sort of double time. And this is a thing that was going on in Kansas City. And of course, Charlie Parker was a master of this. So when he put these two things together, that, that, that double time playing, 
with the idea that you can use extended notes, suddenly he could just fly. But and another thing we must mention about Charlie Parker is his phrasing. He changes jazz phrasing. Like I said, Louis Armstrong was so important. That sort of swinging Louis Armstrong way of phrasing is in all jazz. It's everywhere. Every musician plays like that. You know, all the drummers are going to copy Louis, but Charlie Parker comes in with these different bebops, as is the word says, bebop. That's that's the new phrasing. It's faster, it's more involved, it goes over the bars, it sweeps, it does all this stuff. Right, and now if you're a drummer, you're not trying to play like Louis Armstrong. You're going. If you're a. Sorry, the spat then. It's all these noises I'm having to make in my mouth. I hope you couldn't see that on the camera because it will uh, it will be disgusting. But I did and anyway. That's the way it is. We're in the we're in the. We, I I think it's very apt that I actually spat when we got to bebop because I think bebop, sophisticated as it is, everyone forgets that this is the punk of jazz. These are the new the new era coming in and wiping away the old. You know the old guard. Louis hated bebop. He he, he would go out and take the Mickey out of it. You know. But here we have Bebop with this new style of music, a new way of phrasing. It's going to change music all, all over again. And here we are at the cusp now of the beginnings of rock and pop music, which is, I want to really now track how that develops, how the blues works with that, you know, on the next video. But for now, I will finish there in by part three of the history of jazz. I hope you're enjoying this. Um, there will be some more to come and I'm going to get into the nooks and crannies of some of the stuff I'm talking about as well. But I hope you like this anyway. Um, that's the end of the video. If you like it, like it. If you um, want to subscribe, subscribe. You know, please put your comments in there. You know, if, if this is the sort of thing you like and if there's anything you want me to talk about in more depth, you know, because I'm going, this is like a, it's not, it's not a fast overview of jazz. This is going to take a few videos, but it's the, uh, it's um it's it's re it's it's really nippy and I know I'm missing a load of people out. God am I living I will go back, but anyway, I hope you like this and uh, I will see you soon on the next video. Thank you very much. Bye.